Hey everyone, it's John Lorden. And it's Daniel Hallen, and welcome back to Crime After Crime. Episode four. I can't believe it. <laughs> I feel like it's gone by so fast. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's just, it's such a highlight for me. I really appreciate being able to do this with you, Danielle, being able to get together once a month, throwing these stories up against each other, having the fun little competition <laughs> angle. Uh, Keeping each other sane as opposed to just staring at our computers all the time. Yes. At least we can stare at each other at our computers. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and it, that is a really important aspect of it. it I think it's pretty rare um, that especially in this YouTube space, that you would be able to find a friend that is doing similar work to what you're doing and you have the same concerns and you're able to bounce ideas off each other. Uh, I really appreciate you being there. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, John. You're so sweet. I appreciate you too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we've got a big, kind of big announcement. I'm really excited about this. We have a special project that... Um, We've been talking about working on, <laughs> I know that's weird, I guess planning is the right word, uh, with Sheila Waisaki. And, uh-oh, Danielle just got excited. I did. I got very excited. I couldn't hold myself back. Anyone that knows me knows how much I love Sheila Waisaki and her work. Yes. And Without Warning is an excellent podcast. Uh, I went to a breakout session that she held at CrimeCon in 2018. And I was just blown away by how she presented the information. They had all these different rooms that you would walk through that had, you know, like big 3D models of the gun that was used. And then a different room had the setup of where the body was found with a dummy and, you know, blood marking where the wound was. It was, it was just a really interesting way to dive into a case. And Sheila, once we developed our friendship with her, um, started talking to me regularly and she knew that I went to it and she just wanted feedback. You know, how could she make it a little bit better? What could she do? Um, so I've been in regular communication with her and through that, we came to the decision to try to work together for CrimeCon 2019. And that means that Danielle and myself are going to be doing a series of special podcasts leading up to that breakout session. And then the night of that breakout session, we're going to do a live podcast from there. So if you come to CrimeCon 2019, uh, I think you're going to have to pay a little bit extra for the ticket to the breakout session. It's totally worth it. I think last year I paid maybe $40 for it or something like that. Yeah. And I was kicking myself because remember, I didn't have the chance to go. I was so upset. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And as someone who loves you know visuals and understanding a crime scene and seeing things, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And she also had the family members there. She had oh, yeah. you know, the victim's parents were there speaking. There was experts speaking. It was just a really well done thing. And there was hundreds of people in attendance. It, it, it exceeded their expectations in terms of how many people engaged with that. So Danielle and myself are going to do special kind of podcasts. I believe they will be hosted on Facebook. I don't think that they're going to be coming out through our regular crime after crime channels, but we will let you know as we get closer to all this. But essentially, um, if you do decide to do this breakout session, there's a Facebook group that you follow and they start releasing information there months before the actual session. So you can really gain the knowledge, get all the inside information. And then by the time you go to that session, you can go there armed with great questions. And theories. Yeah, mm -hmm. theories that you could bounce off. And you're working with other private investigators mm -hmm. as they're taking you through these displays. Uh, so, And then, of course, that night after all that wraps, Danielle and myself will be set up at a booth and people can come up and tell us their ideas and theories. We're going to talk about that. And it's all also going to be broadcast live. So even if you can't make it for some reason – you will also be able to still be a part of it and hear the outcome. So we're really excited. What do you think, Danielle? I am so incredibly excited. You know how upset I was that I missed it last year. And I just had to sit there and listen to you and Sheila talk about it. <laughs> and I was kicking myself because, as I said, I'm such a visual person. I need yeah. hands-on. There's nothing better to me than 
diving deep into a case and having the information given to me. And I know Sheila does that actually with her Patreon supporters. She, you know, for her podcast and oh my goodness, I'm excited. I'm going to be just as excited as everybody else there. I'm really excited to hear everyone's ideas. Well, it's so important to me to hear other people's ideas and their theories because we all see things from a different perspective. Yeah. And Uh, it's going to be very interesting, I think. It is. It is. And we don't know what the case is yet. I know one of the things they're considering is making it a case local to where CrimeCon is going to be, which is New Orleans. Uh, so it might be a case from there, but it could also be a case from somewhere else. Regardless, I know the types of cases she takes. She takes very tough, usually cold oh, yeah. cases. So it's going to be a ride one way or the other. If you can be there, uh, please be there. Come on out, meet Danielle and myself. It's a lot of fun. And then if you choose to be a part of that breakout session, I think you're really going to be in for something special. Uh, just a reminder, we have the Crime After Crime Twitter account up and running. It is at Crime After Pod, and that's one of the places where you can vote to let us know who told the better story, Danielle or myself. Voting at the Twitter account only goes for seven days after the episode drops. So if you're listening to this on the first of the month, you're probably okay to jump over to the Twitter account, leave your vote. But if you're listening to it on the eighth of the month, you probably missed the window. However, there's another way you can still get your vote in, Danielle. You guys can still vote on YouTube. I feel like it's continuously helping everyone understand when I put this timestamp down. A lot of people, again, had confusions. Um, So at the end of the podcast, if you are on YouTube, you will hear us talk about putting in your votes and a little eye will pop up in the corner of the screen and you can hit that, cast your vote for me. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I saw how oh, you did that goodness. there. <laughs> That's fine. Don't no, cast your vote for John, <clears throat> me, uh-oh, and uh-oh. it's really that easy. I'll put a timestamp. I think I put it last time in the comments as a pinned comment and in the description. So if you miss it, you can always go down, look for the timestamp, go back to the time, and then you can vote for me. And look for the little eye. It is a little eye that pops yeah. up in the upper right-hand corner, and it's not there for a whole lot of time. So if you clicked the timestamp and you didn't see it, just go click the timestamp again and keep an, keep an eye on that upper right-hand corner. You'll see it there. Um, so we did have over a 1,000 votes on last episode. And I guess before we get to those results, we should talk about this is the fourth episode. The first episode, Danielle won. Yes. The second episode. Wasabi pants. Wasa- <laughs> yes, wasabi was- pants. Wasabi pants. Wasabi pants took the to day. it had to be mentioned in every single video, so I'm here to do that for you. <laughs> there wasabi are still pants. comments. Yeah. On the Twitter <laughs> account, I'm seeing wasabi pants being talked about constantly. Uh, it's definitely more popular than hot dog tongs, and I, I do think that the right winner won that one. Uh, the second episode, I came out on top, and now we're talking about the results for the third episode. What happened, Danielle? I'm riveted. Well, we knew it was going to be very, very close. And all the commenters also said, this is going to be a tight one because I feel like we both brought forward such great stories from different angles. Yours was very, very different than mine in the sense of it was, I mean, that was a planned out, planned out getaway. Yeah. But on Twitter... I won with 72%. Whoa. (laughs) Ow, my butt. (laughs) I feel like I've just been kicked. I wasn't expecting it to be that much of a difference. 72%, Danielle, to my 28%. I think someone might have paid people to vote for me. It wasn't me. (laughs) It wasn't me. It wasn't. I promise you. But I really, I was not expecting it to be that much of a difference. And it was pretty much the same on YouTube. It was 68% to 31. Yeah. Yeah. It was a blowout. Um, And once again, I do think that the audience got it right. Uh, When you're talking about getaways like that, um, you're you're right. The, the, The stories were so different because mine was about organized crime. There was obviously a Mr. Big, spent a lot of money, pulled in a lot of people, probably set up for these fall guys that are sitting in jail right now. So it's at a whole different level as opposed to DB Tuber. Oh my goodness. Who is a guy that put it together himself and 
had a, yeah. done a pretty genius job at it. So even looking back at it, I'm a big fan of, of DB Tuber myself. And then there was that whole fun angle to the story where he really straightened up his life and kind of did better, you know, as he moved past that event. So yeah, he did. Apparently, according to some commenters, he was on a show, I think on YouTube where he talked, it's, I think it's robbers or criminals talk to kids or something. That's what it's called. I don't know where he, I guess that's one of the things where he would go and speak to youth to encourage them to not, you know, rob an armed truck and then get away on a raft. I don't know, but I still think he is so lucky to, to still be alive. Uh, I think that's just the, the major thing when you're going after a Brink security guy that, you know, is armed and you're just pepper spraying the guy in the face. Wow. Oh man. Yeah. That was, that was impressive. I still personally, I always vote for you. Oh, I voted for you too. I do. Yeah, no, I do too. That's how I go to see the results when I'm getting the numbers and stuff. <laughs> You're I, like, I only vote for you to see what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the Twitter one, because I don't know if you guys know, but basically right now I'm managing the Twitter account. Um, but on YouTube, I do exactly what we're telling them to do. I go down to the description box. I find the time mm-hmm. code. I click that. Then I go and hit the I. I put my vote in for Danielle and then it shows me the results. So that's actually kind of another side benefit to your voting is you can actually see the results as soon as you place your vote if you're curious about who's winning for that particular episode as well. Well, thank you for your vote, Danielle, but it didn't help. You you need to uh, tell more of your your subscribers to vote for me. (laughs) I'm telling you, yours was still personally my favorite story because again, it reminded me of the Italian job. I love it. I love cars. All of that was so fascinating. And I don't understand how the guy on the motorcycle, just no one found him. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand it at all. That's a really weird aspect of that case for sure. Speaking of, we've got, oh, See, I was I trying to, to just rush past it. Yeah, she pulled I up had the to mug. Pull out the mug. I did. You're right. Here, let me let me hand it over it. to you. <laughs> How did that happen? We have two mugs here. I'm going the know. wrong way. Just I don't know. Here. Every way. There you go. She now has <laughs> the mug. By the way, I, I I don't mess with the mug. Seriously, when you win the mug, my copy of the mug stays in the cupboard. I don't use it, but I did use it a lot last month. So it's a very <laughs> serious thing. This is. This is thing. <laughs> so now we're on to our next topic. Today's episode, worst motive to murder. And before I jump in or we jump into the stories here, I just want to say this was a tough research job. It really was because as you guys know, we, we try to keep things kind of balanced and we, you know, bring you up with something a little bit more calm and then we come back down sometimes with something a little bit more dark. And these are at such a borderline. Yeah. It was really, really difficult to find a good one. It's weird because um, you don't want to trivialize the fact no. that someone lost their life. So exactly. it's, that's what made it really tough. I started my research process and I was like, There's plenty of, you can find list after list after list with this topic. But as you start looking into the cases, you're like, that's a pretty dark story. I mean, yeah, it started with this kind of weird twist of what the motive is, but ultimately someone's losing their life. So I really had to find this good balance of the motive that's weird, but then the way that I wrote the story out, I wanted to be sure to convey all the the real tragedy and the humanity of it as well. Exactly. Because my problem is I was going through and I would see a title on a website and it was, it was like the most bizarre motive and it would almost make you like giggle because you're like, that's so weird. Why would anyone do that? Yeah. But then you get into it and you're like, this is really sad. It was, it was very difficult. And then the titles of it make it very misleading and you think it's one thing, and yeah. then you get into it, and it's just really not. So it was it was a challenge this month. Yeah, it's and a there's big challenge. There's also a, another aspect in terms of finding a story that is significant enough to tell, because there's a lot of these, you know, two or one or two sentence versions of these worst motive to murder stories. But when you go looking for details on it, it's just it's not enough to even you know write one page on. So, um, with all that being said, I'm ready to get into this, Danielle. I am ready. All right. Okay. So this one is one that I feel like a lot of people will probably be like, oh, I can I can see how this would anger someone. But it is so strange to me. It's the worst motive anybody 
could use for murder. It's horrible. Escalated very, very quickly. So Stephen Carr was a 48-year-old single man, and he was living in the Orange Hunt neighborhood in Fairfax County, Virginia. He was very well-known, very well-liked, and he was one of those people that really went above and beyond to make sure rules were upheld, the neighborhood stayed safe. He would always bring his neighbors' papers to their door. He was just that kind of guy. He would help people with their yard work, you know, cleaning out gutters, mowing the grass. He was very, very helpful. So it only made sense that he was refusing to tolerate reckless drivers that would drive down the main neighborhood road speeding, especially since it was relatively close to a nearby elementary school and the potential for harming a child was very, very high. Because the subdivision that he lived in, it was a bunch of cul-de-sacs kind of stemming off of this larger main road. But it was also in between, I think, two of the most used roads in the area. So when people would get stuck in traffic, they would see this side road and they would be angry because they've sat in traffic and they would just fly down this road. Right. Not really knowing it was a family neighborhood. So he tried many different ways to encourage drivers to drive responsibly, but they simply didn't seem to be working. So he decided to take a pretty large step at forcing these drivers to slow down. So he worked with County Supervisor Pat Harity to get a speed bump installed on the road, pretty much directly in front of his house. Okay. And well, it was a lot, it was actually a pretty big task to do this. I didn't really know what went into putting a speed bump into a neighborhood, but apparently it required neighborhood consent and traffic engineering studies to make sure it was the safest and most approved of option. So he started the speed bump campaigning in May of 2008. And most people in the neighborhood agreed. They wanted their children safe. It was, you know, a very happy, tight knit neighborhood. There was an HOA. So I'm sure that kind of tells you these people were very invested in where they lived and they wanted to keep it safe. But there were some people that were not happy with it. So people would actually drive by Stephen's house at night and just lay on their horns and verbally scream their disagreement with the speed bump like to his house. He's inside living his best life, watching TV, hanging out with his girlfriend, and people would just yell at his house. But there was one man that took things very far after the speed bump was actually approved and put into place. I'm sure you can all see where this is going. Yep. So on June 11th, 2010, 44-year-old neighbor David Patton lived a few streets away, and he decided he was done with the speed bump. He was very over it. He didn't like it. I'm assuming because he lived a few streets away that maybe he used this road a lot to get to one of the main roads. That's what I was going to ask. He didn't even live on that street, and he's got this big issue with it. It must have been like part of his commute or something. Oh, yeah. And again, he probably used this to get around traffic. And if he's stuck in traffic, he's obviously already agitated about that, likely. But on that night, just before 9 p.m., he showed up at Stephen's house as Stephen was trying to back his car into his driveway. And David Patton pulled up at the end of his driveway, blocking him from getting in there. And a verbal altercation ensued over the speed bump. So eventually, David ended up moving his car, and Stephen really thought that he had finally escaped the argument and could get into his house without further conflict. But just as he attempted to back into his driveway for the second time, David walked over again and started arguing with Stephen all over again about the speed bump. He ended up striking Stephen's windows, his I think his back windshield and his side windows multiple times, and then even reached in and grabbed Stephen's arm, all while screaming about the speed bump. Wow. So at this point, both of the men are infuriated, and both of them actually end up calling 911. And David even asked for an ambulance, saying that Stephen had hit him with his car. Now, I'm unsure if this actually happened. Stephen, I'll get there. But anyways, (laughs) they came. Police came. No one was really able to tell if there was a big altercation because it was one person's claim over the other. So they couldn't arrest anybody. No legal action could be taken. They could just split these men up and say, go home. It's a speed bump. Calm down. Right. So the following day, Stephen wasn't pleased with that. So he ended up going to the magistrate and complained to hopefully have a warrant sent out for David. And then on July 6th, David was arrested. So he did successfully have something to where they went to arrest him. And he, I'm pretty sure he was arrested for assault. Yeah. So 
With now not only pent up anger towards Stephen because of the speed bump, he also was infuriated that he had been arrested because of Stephen. And he ended up making a very rash and fatal decision to retaliate. So on Sunday, September 12th, 2010, just before, just before 10 p.m., David burst through Stephen's front door while he was at home relaxing, watching TV with his girlfriend, Rena. And David told them both to get on the floor and then proceeded to restrain their hands with zip ties. Uh-oh. Yeah. So Stephen attempted to free himself. He was desperately trying to get out. He was screaming at David. He wanted to protect himself. He wanted to protect his girlfriend. I mean, imagine having someone just burst through your front door you know, that's already tried to harm you one time. But this obviously only angered David more. So the men ended up struggling quite a bit on the floor and Rena attempted to escape. And as she ran from the home with her hands bound, she heard a gunshot shortly followed by David running away from the house and after her. And he eventually caught up to her and ended up dragging her back inside the home. So I don't think she saw anything at this point, but right after she was brought back into the home, Stephen's male roommate that had been across the street at a friend's house ended up hearing the commotion and ran over and he was shocked at what he walked into. Stephen had been shot and killed. So the gunshot they heard was David shooting Stephen over being angry about a speed bump being put in. Yeah. And there was his girlfriend still sitting with her hands bound together David also tried to get the roommate to go down to the ground and tried to tie him up, but he ended up getting distracted. So the neighbor ran from the home. Again, David tried to follow him and bring him back into the home. Now, Stephen's girlfriend saw this as a prime time to go upstairs, call 911, and police actually arrived in less than two minutes and sealed off the entire neighborhood because at this point he had run out of the house. Nobody knew where he was. So neighbors did actually report seeing him running down the street, chasing after the roommate. And just minutes later, he was walking back up the street in handcuffs. So they got him very fast, but they actually found him in Stephen's backyard, carrying a backpack filled with zip ties and a revolver. So he knew what he was going to do. Oh, yeah. It's premeditation. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. He came over ready to tie people up and ready to shoot somebody. Um, he ended up being charged with first degree murder, um, the murder of Stephen Carr and abduction for zip tying Stephen's girlfriend. And he was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years in prison on August 19th of that year. Yeah. And then he was sentenced 10 extra years for the abduction of Rena. And he'll have to serve 85% of his sentence before he's eligible for parole. And according to a lot of people, he apparently was very remorseful during the trial. He apologized to Stephen's family. He apologized to even his own daughters, saying that he had let them down. So his attorney actually argued that he was going through a very, very rough time in life. He had been dishonorably discharged from the military. He worked as a sheriff's deputy for a short time and then left and became a long distance trucker. He just really wasn't pleased with his life. I feel like he was struggling with a lot of things, probably internally. Um, And he actually began drinking a lot and then was diagnosed with a handful of mental health conditions. But one thing I find very interesting is to this day, his attorney refuses to agree that the motive stemmed from the speed bump. Well, I'm I'm kind of wondering about that myself a little bit, just because it developed from there. It seems like the speed bump was the initial thing that yep. upset him. But like you pointed out, he had a bunch of baggage already coming into this emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but from that, we have the separate interactions. Do you know how long it was between the first time where he was smacking uh, Steve's window and then later when he actually broke in? It was June 11th. When the initial uh, situation happened where, yeah, he p- ended up putting his hands apparently on Stephen. And then I'm pretty sure I said it was August. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was August when he Yeah, so you have a couple next. months. Or no, September 12th. It's, it was about a month and a half, two months almost. Yeah, yeah. Months, so you've yeah. got some time where things are kind of festering and we have kind of th- – multiple points of interaction because you also have Stephen reaching out to the police, the police reaching out to him. So he's seeing that as another attack coming back from Stephen. So oh, exactly. it is interesting to me that it, it does certainly stem from the speed bump, but it's almost like they're in a relationship they don't want to be in. Like they're, they're kind of tangling up with each other. And within the course of a few months, it escalates really badly. 
Oh, yeah. But I mean, they even talked to the homeowners association. They came forward with, I guess, a short response. And they said that their residents actually frequently get very angered over minuscule things. <laughs> they they did. They opened up. They were like, you know what? This happens all the time. We just had no idea it would push someone as far as, you know, murdering somebody. Yeah. It's like this chain reaction that obviously ended horribly. But to me, the one thing, like I was, I was questioning a lot. I understand that his attorney says that's not, you know, the reason why he ended up murdering Steven. Right. But the fact that he was even comfortable coming and putting his hands on him and trying to destroy his vehicle in the first encounter over the speed bump, yeah. that obviously shows he was not happy and he was willing to go to an extreme level to express that anger. Yeah, And that's, that's why I can't, I'm not willing to throw out the idea that it all stemmed from that. I'm sure it, it built up on it, obviously, but right. if he was that angry off the get-go, yeah, that's a really good point. That's a good point. So he 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 was emotionally bothered, and they have no history. They didn't know each other before that. Not that I know of. Okay. Um, I know that he was very again. Stephen was very helpful in the community in their neighborhood. He helped a lot of people with a ton of different things. But I don't know. It never said if they had any sort of relationship prior to this. I'm sure living relatively close, there's a chance they bumped into each other, but. I don't know. It would have come out in trial. You would have yeah. you would have bumped into that in your research. I'm sure that the defense would have said, you know, these guys have a longstanding history and here's how he was wronged before this or yeah. something along those lines. So. Well, it was also very difficult because he, again, you know, started campaigning to get the speed bump. So everybody knew him, whereas he might not have known other people. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of people knew him because he was the one fighting so hard for a speed bump. I mean, he went out and did all sorts of things. And to he got it done. People. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he which did. is which might be part of it as well. That could also anger some people seeing, I mean, especially if you're talking about a guy that's struggling in life and feels like he can't really make things happen the way he wants them to. And all of a sudden he's got this neighbor that's coming through and convincing everyone they need to add a speed bump somewhere. And, you know, all of a sudden he yeah. sees a speed bump pop up. Um, yeah, that there's an interesting angle to that as well. But obviously this, this David guy was pretty challenged and had some really dark things going on. Oh yeah. And then especially the way he carried everything out. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just like he got angry and then snapped and shot him. I mean, he was like, forget this guy. Like, yeah. He went in, I mean, to even try, I mean, he tried to tie everybody up, chase people across the neighborhood to keep them in the house. Like, that's wild to me. Yeah, there's an aspect of like terrorizing people that is coming up with all that. Because if his intent was that he was just going to take care of Steven, he could have just showed up with a gun and, you know, oh, yeah. 10 seconds later been running away and that's that. But instead, he had this bag and all this preparation. And then even the way he's handling people, you know, chasing them down and then bringing back the girlfriend, not killing mm -hmm. her. Like there's there's just terrorism happening with these actions. Absolutely. And I have also heard, and I couldn't find this on many sources, but they did find, I think, a box or something near the area that they couldn't 100% link back to David. But I guess it had an old sheriff's badge in it, like all these other random things. Wow. Wow. And it was just kind of, it looked like he'd almost thrown it at one point. I think there was also a case for a gun, a different gun. And so I don't know. He just, he yeah. seemed a little bit disturbed. So... Well, as someone who, as a child, actually got hit by a car in front of my street, I think mm. getting the speed bump put in wasn't necessarily the bad thing for a neighborhood. Um, oh, absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. You know, you're trying to, to make your neighborhood safer for everyone that lives there. And, uh, you know, I always think twice when I'm driving around the neighborhood and they've got those signs that are about the size of children, like the plastic yeah. signs that are standing at the side of the road. And uh, yeah, I really wish people would pay more attention to that. Getting home on, you know, a little bit faster is exactly. ultimately not all that important. <laughs> it's not. It's so frustrating because I understand how frustrating it is to sit in traffic. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. I do it every single day. I think we all do it. But in the end, what do you, you, you get what? one, maybe two minutes ahead if you're lucky. And then that right. somehow, you know, ends up costing people lives. And yeah. 
Yeah. So I think it's great. People are just self-absorbed sometimes, I think, and they really just think their time is the only time and forget anyone else until oh, something real it. happens to them. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the same thing when I was younger and living in the Los Angeles area. I I would take Ooh. the 101 to the 405 and sit on the 405 and you'd be pulling up next to cars where people are literally yelling out the window and shaking their fist. And it's almost like the anger is infectious in some way. Then all of a sudden oh, you're, yeah. you're angry because they're angry and you want to honk your horn too. Um, but there was something, I don't know what happened in particular where I just kind of figured out I didn't want to be part of that anymore. I didn't want to do that. And all of a sudden I just started driving completely different and leaving room in front of me. And if people cut in because they thought that that was going to get them somewhere 30 seconds faster, I just didn't care. See, and I'm the I'm the exact same way. I've always been like that. Like when I'm stuck in traffic, there's nothing I can do. And being angry only hurts me, yeah. <laughs> you know, unless I do something dumb that ends up hurting someone else. But I just take the extra time yeah. to, you know, talk to my kids listen to some good music, yeah, yeah, exactly. catch up on podcasts, right. wink, wink. Like there, I, you know, there's better things to fill your time with. You're not going to accomplish anything right. being angry. Yeah. Yeah. So, and ultimately if it really bothers you, you just move to Minnesota. That's my advice. <laughs> Where um, there's just no traffic ever. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Well, Minneapolis can get a little dicey, um, but yeah, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of traffic out here. Um, although there's a lot of construction because of the weather. So oh. basically when it's not snowing out here, the roads are all under construction and frequently you get, you know, highways that are knocked down to one lane and blah, blah, blah. But it's still, it's nowhere near what I was dealing with when I was in Los Angeles. It's not even close. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, maybe we should have titled today's episode, um, Horrible Neighbors. Maybe that would no, have been really. appropriate. Oh yeah, because are you about to are you about to get me with a horrible neighbor? I think so. I think we're going to continue with terrible neighbors and really bad motives to murder. Some people love it, other people hate it. But could karaoke be the worst possible motive to murder? 36-year-old physical education teacher Kelly Danaher was known for his energetic and encouraging spirit at Sorters Mill Elementary School, where he worked for 10 years. But on the night of May 2nd, 2010, there's that year again, no, no. he was wearing another hat as a caring husband and father, throwing a combined birthday party for his wife, Mindy, and their three-year-old daughter, Perry, at their two-acre property in Huffman an unincorporated community in Harris County, Texas. Two houses away, 44-year-old neighbor Raul Rodriguez, who lived in the neighborhood for five years, wasn't happy with how loud the party was. He called police and complained about the noise, largely coming from a karaoke machine. Around midnight, he could still hear the party, and he picked up a flashlight, his iPhone, and armed himself with a handgun. He walked to the Danaher family's driveway, recording video on his iPhone the entire time. Rodriguez can be heard several times talking about having to defend himself, how he feared for his life, all despite the fact that he walked over there and put himself into the situation, and he wasn't doing anything to leave it. He called 911 again while recording, saying, quote, I had to draw my weapon on somebody because I told them to stop. I'm going to have to defend myself. I'm going to have to defend myself. My life is in danger now. I'm standing my ground here. Now these people are going to try and kill me. My eyes could not roll any harder in the back of my head. That yeah. is so frustrating. Yeah, it's really frustrating. And there's actually um, parts of this video that have been released. And when you listen to it for yourself, oh, it, man. It's, it's super upsetting because you hear him doing this talk and trying to convince himself. And, you know, I'm not trying to paint the party goers as perfect people. There's oh, no, guys but... out there, they're yelling at him, but he's pointed a gun at one of their family members uh, by the time that the, the recording that's available that you see that. So I get why they wanted to address him. You know, they wanted to try oh, to yeah. de-escalate him, get him away oh, yeah. from their family and their property. Uh, but there's another thing that really bothers me about it. And Despite the fact that he's saying all these words, I don't personally hear a whole lot of fear in his voice. You know, there's it's, just... Uh, 
it's just from the outside it sounds like a covering his butt ordeal happening here kind of does and stay tuned because you might not be too far from the truth he then tells the dispatcher look i'm not losing to these people anymore a few moments later when three men come towards him including fire department captain rick captain ricky johnson rodriguez opens fire all three men were shot including 33 year old marshall stetson who continued his motion and tackled Rodriguez to the ground, fracturing Rodriguez's ankle in the process. Marshall then helped disarm and restrain Rodriguez while waiting for the police and emergency services to arrive. Quote, thankfully, my husband tackled the guy when he did so, so no one else got hurt, even jamming the gun after being shot in the leg, said Tammy Stetson, Marshall's wife, who was also at the party. Marshall was taken to the hospital, treated, and soon released. Fire Department Captain Ricky Johnson would undergo more than five hours of surgery at Ben Taub General Hospital and would remain there in critical condition for a number of days in an induced coma, but would eventually return home to his wife and two daughters. Unfortunately, Kelly Danaher, the husband and father throwing the party, would be pronounced dead at the scene. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. The elementary school PE teacher... That was throwing a party for his wife and daughter. Oh, my goodness. Quote, he got it in his head that they were making too much noise and he decided to take it into his own hands, Harris County Sergeant Ben Beal said. The people at the party were minding their own business. In fact, Harris County did send an officer to the home based on the initial complaint called in by Rodriguez earlier that day. But they found that the homeowner was in compliance and they left. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So that just makes him look so much more questionable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Absolutely. I mean, to know that he calls in the complaint, they go and check it out. Everyone says everything's cool at the party. And by the way, you know, you've got a fire captain for a fire department that's at this party. You've got a guy that's a teacher at the school. You know, this isn't a bunch of kids or thugs that are terrorizing the neighborhood here. These are... Uh, kind of upstanding citizens yeah. that are c- contributors to their community. Um, Raul Rodriguez is actually also a uh, retired firefighter. Um, neighbors say that Raul Rodriguez has a history of violence in the neighborhood, including an incident where he hit a neighbor between the eyes with a rifle barrel. In some state, he's even shot animals belonging to his neighbors, including a Rottweiler dog. Others say his demeanor could switch at a moment's notice and he could go from a friendly talker to a gun-flashing bully. That is absolutely terrifying. Isn't it? It's probably one of the scariest things. Yeah, and I didn't didn't really include too much of the detail, but the instance about the dog is not – it's really not good. Um, This is not something where he, like, just shot the dog. This was, like, torturing the animal for hours. And it's yeah. the same kind of scenario where it's, you know, my way or the highway and it's like, you know, forget everyone else. Like if I'm uncomfortable with something, it has to change now. You know right. what I mean? That's so upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. One neighbor stated that Raul didn't know how to let stuff go. He was always judging people and had problems with neighbors. Interestingly, no other neighbors noted the party was excessively loud. People at the party say it was winding down and they were actually cleaning up when Rodriguez showed up at the driveway. Raul Rodriguez was charged with murder and two counts of aggravated assault. In June of 2012, the trial began. Friends and family of the victim, Kelly Danaher, showed up wearing yellow bracelets displaying his name. Of course, there's also the big question of the iPhone footage that Rodriguez was recording. Would it help or hurt his case? Initially, only seven minutes of the 22-minute video were shown to the jury. In those seven minutes, Rodriguez is seen shining a flashlight in the face of several party guests, demanding they turn down the music. However, there is no music being picked up by his iPhone as he's recording. Right at the end of the video, there is a loud laugh as the phone drops and the first gunshot is heard. Then the recording ends. Of course, his attorney says that he was acting in self-defense. I'm not sure who charged, said defense attorney Bill Stradley, but it scared the hell out of Raul Rodriguez, and he had half a second to decide what to do. The prosecution disagrees, stating that Raul was the one person in control of the nightmare out there that night. 
The defense would say the rest of the video proves Raul's innocence. So eventually the jury got to see the entire thing. In that version, some music from the karaoke setup can be heard as Raul is approaching the driveway. The neighbor that lived between Rodriguez and Kelly also took the stand and said he heard Rodriguez cussing about Kelly the day before the incident. Rodriguez also called this neighbor several times that day, trying to get his help in shutting the party down. A different neighbor that lives across the street from Rodriguez testified he could hear music while he was outside, but not in his house. He also said it's the first time in three years that he's lived there that he's even seen a party at the Dan and her residence. Fire Department Captain Kelly Johnson also took the stand. He denied coming at Rodriguez aggressively, stating, I took two normal steps toward him. I was about 20 to 25 yards away from him. He started the process by bringing a gun. You have to do what you have to do to protect your wife and kids. The last witness to be called by the prosecution was Kelly's wife, Mindy. She broke down on the stand and described the horrible night she lost her husband. After five hours of jury deliberation, they came back with a verdict. Raul Rodriguez was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in jail. He would be eligible for parole after 20. Kelly Danaher's mother, Connie, used Raul's own words against him on the witness stand during a victim impact statement. Eternal fire and damnation is not enough for what you took from us. Every single day that you are incarcerated, I pray that you come to know the true meaning of, I fear for my life. Mindy Danaher said that she was hoping for a sentence of life in prison, but figured that with 40 years and considering his age, Raul would never see freedom again. She would, however, be mistaken. Oh, no. Texas has what's known as a stand your ground law, also known as the Castle Doctrine. According to the Houston Chronicle, it was revised in 2007 to expand the right to use deadly force. The new version allows people to defend themselves not only in their homes, but also in workplaces or vehicles. It also says a person using force cannot provoke the attacker or be involved in criminal activity at the time. The jury believed that Raul was indeed provoking the attack with his actions, despite whatever he was saying for the benefit of the recording. Prosecutors also stated Rodriguez was parroting buzzwords he learned in a concealed handgun licensing class, like, I'm standing my ground, and escalating the situation. They also stated, he felt he had the ultimate control, the control to decide who lives and who dies. Self-defense was never meant to protect the one who started the fight. Rodriguez's legal team stated that their client made the wrong call because of the stand your ground laws in Texas. The defense team also said other people will make the wrong call about laws that permit the use of force when someone feels threatened and they will find themselves like Raul Rodriguez charged with murder. In 2014, one aspect of that argument was used to win an appeal for Rodriguez. Houston's first court of appeals stated that the jury's instructions on the law regarding self-defense were so confusing that Rodriguez did not get a fair trial. Mindy Danaher's worst fear, fear came true. Raul Rodriguez was released from jail and granted a retrial that began in late 2015. Though his legal team changed the story a bit, now stating that he was recording specifically to have proof of the noise complaint, it didn't help. And he once again lost. Good. So, I'm over here happy about that personally. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a twist I did not see coming. I have never heard of this happening in a retrial before. Since his original sentence was vacated, they gave him a new one. And in a strange twist of fate, Mindy Danaher finally got what she originally wanted, Raul Rodriguez is now serving life in prison. Wow. Mindy ran a memorial fund for her husband uh, for a period of time, and money was also raised to build a playground at Sorter Mills Elementary in Kelly Danaher's honor. I'm personally hoping that the prison Raul Rodriguez is sitting in starts up an inmate karaoke program. Seriously, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. That is absolutely unbelievable. And obviously I haven't heard all the recording, but I cannot get over. I'm glad you mentioned the phrases he was using when, when you were stating them at first, I was like, this is so planned. He's protecting himself. 
you know, because you, you see it a lot. People will record themselves doing something wrong and they'll start saying these key phrases I to make to it, do this. to I sway to, it. Exactly. Yeah. To make it sound one way when it might not be. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And there was other things um, in the recording. There's at one point you can hear, and I think it's Kelly that's actually saying this back to Raul. Um, because they know that he's armed. He's already pointed the gun at one person. Exactly. And at one point, Kelly says something like, you know, hey, I can go inside and level up this situation real quick, you know, basically, you know, insinuating that he can go get his gun and they'll be on a level playing field. Yeah. And then a few minutes later, Raul's talking to the 911 dispatcher and he's saying something like, they're saying that they can go in their house and, and, and be stronger than I am in this situation. Like just not even accurate for what Kelly actually yeah. said to him. And once again, making the statement that they were intending to harm him, even though he's the one standing at their driveway. You know, he's not at home. It, exactly. And he showed up with a gun ready to go to yeah. begin with. Granted, I do know a lot of people do carry, but if he had been sitting at home all day long, I highly doubt he just had his gun holstered ready on him. He picked that up probably when he left. Yeah. And then even if you consider this argument about him recording it to prove that there's a noise disturbance or something along those lines, record it from your house because exactly. that would actually prove it. If you're inside your house and you fire up your recorder and you're like, hey, do you hear that? Someone's singing Summer Lovin' from Greece and, <laughs> and I'm trying to go to sleep. Um, I think that would be much better proof if you are going to actually try to file some charge or go talk to the authorities about the fact that they didn't do their job right by not shutting down the party off the first complaint. Yeah, but he, I mean, man, you can tell he was really fishing for it though. Yeah. If other neighbors couldn't hear it unless they were outside, he just seems like he was the kind of person that, again, couldn't let things go. And he probably heard it for a bit earlier on in the day and then was just waiting to hear it more and seeing what he could do yeah. To make sure he heard it to have a problem. Yeah. That is so unfortunate. And they were just trying to celebrate their birthdays. That I is know, sick. I know. And all of a sudden, a little girl doesn't have her father anymore. That is so um, heartbreaking. I want to give special thanks to the Houston Chronicle at www.cron.com for their coverage of this case. I had more than 30 articles to go through uh, pulling this all together. They had really, really good coverage on it. Uh, and I didn't see the twists coming, particularly with the court stuff, until I was literally in the middle of it. Um, but I've never quite seen that before, where <laughs> someone goes for a retrial and then wind up with a stiffer penalty. <laughs> I haven't either. I haven't either, because usually they weigh it out pretty pretty good. At least their attorneys do. And they're like, look, <laughs> yeah, your chances aren't great. Maybe, you know, settle for this or, you know what I'm saying? So I would never have expected them to give a harsher, harsher penalty. I'm happy they did. Yeah. Because he seems like he just caused mass destruction in that neighborhood on so many different levels. Yeah. If he knows he has an issue with being around other people, he should have moved himself far away from other people. It does sound like, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of stories. There's yeah. more than I even was able to get in, get in here. Uh, the one that I did mention about the guy that he hit with the barrel of his gun, I think this guy was like working on his fence. Yeah, what? See, yeah. this is what I'm saying. Like yeah. that should have, that's a huge red flag right off the bat. Yeah. That and man terrifies me. Raul hits him like right between the eyes with the barrel of this gun. The guy yeah, actually- the barrel of his gun. Hear yeah. that again? <laughs> the guy grabbed the gun from him and hit him with it. There we go. See? <laughs> Appropriate response in my opinion. Right. He's like, don't you do that to me again. Bah! Yeah, I know. And no charges uh, came out of that one. Um, and it's interesting because even uh, supporters of the stand your ground law and the conceal, uh, concealed handgun licensing laws were pointing at this case of, look, it actually works. You know, you can't yeah. just treat you can't teach people buzzwords and they can go and get away with anything because once this actually comes to a court process, like we saw in the initial trial here, it wasn't enough to cover him. It wasn't enough that he said that he felt threatened and, you know, he had to stand his ground because he was standing in on public property at someone's driveway. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. um, but a little more info on that. Researchers at Texas A&M believe that these laws are actually increasing the number of murder and manslaughter cases uh, when they're actually intended to be a deterrent to crime. In studies, it states that states that institute these laws have a 7 to 
increase in murder and manslaughter cases. And the states that don't implement these laws basically have a number that remains steady. So they are seeing some correlation to an increase. Oh, yeah. It, it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure as crazy as it might sound to say this, but like how many people would probably commit a crime if they knew they could get away with it, if there was a really good chance they could get away with it? Right. It's it's just it's insane. And so to me, I, I see that I see that it would increase it. I think when I was looking, I looked into a similar case on the outside about this, and it was saying that it creates a quick shoot response. You know, instead of right. your brain trying to create these other options to escape the situation or resolve the situation, because you know you could end it quickly, yeah. people jump straight, literally jump the gun. Absolutely, like in every sense of that phrase. Right. Well, and even for what supporters are saying about it, like how this case shows that these laws are appropriate, but they're still relying on the process of it has to go to trial for this yeah. to happen. So that should actually show that there is an increase in these charges yeah. and these cases that are being run through the system. So in one way, it kind of makes sense. But in another way, anytime that you see a number like that escalating, you want to look at it and really oh, think, yeah. really think, is that something that we should be doing? Or is there something else that we could figure out for that process? So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, of course. Those are both some pretty intense neighbor stories here. Yeah, it's too bad these guys didn't leave, live next to each other, huh? Oh, that would have, look, they would have battled it out 100%. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's it's really, really, really terrible. And for karaoke, I went through a period of time where I just absolutely loved karaoke. I was going out Me to karaoke. Me too. Yeah, all the time. And I even still have a pretty decent... Uh, rock band set up here at home that I break out every now and then if I have friends over or something like, like that. I've bought like over 500 songs. and I yeah. love that. That was me all through high school. When I was younger, uh, my dad actually used to take me every Monday to yeah. go do karaoke. I mean, I was probably in elementary school and I was like, dad, we're going to do karaoke tonight. And I mean, nobody would be there. <laughs> I would get up there. I would belt out so many songs. I'm talking like Britney Spears, Spice Girls. I mean, everyone yeah. possible. Well, had a good time. <laughs> we might have to put together some uh, crime con karaoke event crime or something. Con karaoke, yeah. Just leave, leave your crazy neighbors at home. <laughs> they're not, they're not invited. Definitely, uh, Danielle. What other cases did you run into in terms of researching this? Anything else that you wanted to let the audience know about? Actually, yes. I'm now that you've said your story. I really want to tell one about a man named Curtis Reeves Jr. He was actually. It, it goes along with the stand your ground law. Mm -hmm. So 71-year-old retired police captain at Curtis Reeves from Florida got angry enough with a man in a movie theater that was using his phone that he actually shot him. Whoa. So on, yeah, on January 13th, 2014, Curtis and his wife, they were in their seats. They were about to see Lone Survivor when a man named Chad Olson was sitting a row in front of him and started texting while the previews began. Like before they really put the lights down, it was just like when the actual previews and everything started rolling. Yeah. And Curtis was very upset with him for having his phone out and complained to him and then said that he was going to go tell management. And so he went and told management about it. And when he got back, I guess the argument they kept arguing. Um, and in this argument, Chad threw his popcorn uh -oh. at Curtis and yeah. Curtis pulled his gun and shot him in the chest and killed him. Wow. And he used, he used the stand your ground. He said that, but, I mean, they obviously couldn't prove it. None of this went through. Um, so far, like that's, people don't believe it was a stand your ground law, but he actually has yet to even go to trial. Okay. And this happened in 2014 because the stand your ground laws are so finicky. Yeah. And he had, he actually did multiple attempts at trying to get the stand your ground thing to go through every single time it was denied. Um, there were actually a few changes in Florida and the stand your ground law again to use of a deadly weapon. So a gun and, oh man, ah. <sighs> I'm interested to see how that one goes. His, I think his trial is set to start this February. Yeah. I think the 25th of February. But I mean, I understand that Chad threw popcorn at him. Which could be seen. It's definitely an act of aggression, but is it oh, really yeah. an attack? I mean, yeah, it's kind of light. Um, and he was a retired police captain, so he was familiar with the laws. Yeah, yeah. 
The interesting Hopefully. thing about, about right, uh, the laws that I saw, at least in terms of Texas, were very specific about location, that essentially the stand your ground law was applying to if you were literally standing your ground, like you were on your property and something's happening yeah. to you, or in your vehicle and something was happening to you, or even possibly at your workplace, basically a place that you'd be responsible for. Yeah. But in public, I don't, I don't know how I don't that know. applies. I haven't, I wasn't, I didn't dive too deep into it just because this was something that I stumbled upon. I know yeah. in North Carolina, it's very specific as well. Like, I mean, down to the amount of feet you can be out of your door. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. So right, right. I'm unsure, but he tried to use it. So for some reason, I want to assume that maybe it's a little bit more lenient in area Yeah. down in Florida, but I mean, wow, over texting and popcorn. That's yeah. that's a motive for sure. I found I found one that might be kind of close to that. It was about uh two guys uh in St. Louis, Missouri in 2012. They're hanging out in downtown. Uh some reports say that they're homeless, other reports say that's not true. They're not actually homeless. But uh Roger Wilkes was eating a bag of Cheetos and refused to share them with David Scott. David Scott stabs Roger once in the chest and kills him. This is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Bag of Cheetos. I heard another a story. A bag of Cheetos. Yeah. I heard another one that it was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but basically same kind of setup. And in that one, it was homeless men that were fighting mm -hmm. over it. Well, this reminds me a lot of one of the cases that I actually already told you about that I looked into for the most bizarre weapon. Yeah. Yeah about the guy who attacked his family, well, his stepfather with a samurai sword over the canned shrimp. <laughs> oh, right. I don't know, John, if you remember this, but I don't remember exactly where this was location wise, but you know, someone came home, was very angry that someone ate their canned shrimp. Yeah. And I mean, it was like, it was, it was on from there. Yep. Yep. I've heard that. No, I've heard burnt turkey yeah. for Thanksgiving. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I, I believe it's a guy that kills his wife in that story uh, because I, she burnt the turkey. Yeah, I think I saw that. And it's, it's like another one that I saw, this man named Fergus Glenn. He actually killed his brother for not thanking him for dinner. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just saw that. I bumped into that one today. Yeah. And when he was asked, he said, he just annoyed me and I did it. Right. Over not saying thank you. He he used an axe. Yeah. It's horrible. The brother was sleeping. Terrible. Uh, here's one I think might be the absolute worst. Mm -hmm. Robert Lyons stabbed his mother that he was living with when she refused to arrange for him to get Skybox tickets for an Avril Lavigne concert in Chicago. I heard that one and it is crazy to me. I loved Avril Lavigne growing up, but that's a whole other level. And wasn't he in his forties or thirties? 39. Too? He's 39 at the time he did that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, Avril Lavigne's great, but not that great. Yeah, I don't. I can't think of anyone that I would <laughs> kill over. <laughs> no, to kill see over. A concert. No. Oh no. my goodness. Yeah. Well, that's almost what's so frustrating about this topic is that we can't rationalize it. Like a, right. an average person just cannot simply rationalize it because it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you wonder if even these stories that we've heard about if how how real or how true that is. Like in the case you're yeah. talking about with the brothers, they have a whole history together. Who knows what had developed as they grew up together. Oh, obviously yeah. he said he some, didn't like him at all. Yeah. Obviously, there's some really deep-rooted, long-term issues that are being exposed there. And that's just kind of the breaking point of, oh, you know, yep. he didn't say the, thank you for making me dinner. Yeah. The weird straw that ended up breaking the camel's back. Yeah. So what do you think? Who's uh, who's going to win this month, Danielle? We got crazy neighbors on both sides. I don't know. I'm happy, though, that it's crazy neighbors on both sides because that kind of evens the playing field out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Honestly, I don't know. Because Karaoke or a speed bump? They're both ridiculous. Yeah. And it's so – I mean, they're ridiculous. But it's like – it's also so sad for both the families on each side. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yours gets me, though. It's Yours really tough. Really gets me. Yeah, you've got a wife and a daughter left behind, and you've got people that you know. Just looking at their career paths and stuff, these are people that are contributing to society in a very significant way that are being affected by this. And exactly. Yeah, 
yeah, but I do think it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be. Uh, I yeah. think this one will, will be will be closer than last episode. I think this one. Will I think be so. What we were expecting from last episode, but we'll see. Uh, so everyone out there, remember to vote for me. No, actually, yes, I'll be voting for him. <laughs> I'll be voting for him personally because I'll be I'm not. Getting, for you, I'm not so. getting over this guy in this video, but. Seriously, you guys, don't forget to vote. This has, you know, been a really fun spin on doing these. And it's it's very interesting, in my opinion, to see how you guys vote each month. And for me yeah. and John to really talk about, you know, what we think and the stories that are brought forward. And now is like the perfect time for you to look up in the corner of your screen. There will be an I. Again, I'll have a timestamp down below where you guys can click and vote. Or if you're watching this now, hopefully, if you go on Twitter in the very near future, there will also be a poll there. Absolutely. And our next episode is going to be crime, a crime committed in the name of good. And I that was a suggestion. Like, I, I want to thank yeah. the person that suggested that. And we're getting more suggestions. So thank you guys for that. Uh, but yeah, crime in the name of good is going to be, I think it's going to be a tough research job, but I think it's going to be worth it. Oh, yeah. I think it might be probably one of the hardest research jobs we'll have to do so far. Because, again, we, we kind of discussed it beforehand. That could be very – it's very vague. Could be subjective, <laughs> could too. could go many different directions. Exactly. Yeah. What do you consider good? Is that the same as what I consider good? Uh, is killing the murderer of your family member, is that a crime oh, really yeah. in the name of good or not? So I'm going to be really That's interested to see what you bring on that. Yeah, potentially a bunch of controversial different topics. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, we also wanted to go ahead and take the time to recommend another podcast for you guys. And it's one that you've already heard me talk about so many different times. And that is the Vanished Podcast. Yes. You know me. I love missing persons cases. It's what I dive deep into on my personal YouTube channel. And she covers things beautifully. You hear many different interviews with the family. She really paints a great picture for anyone listening. And I know with podcasts, it's very difficult to kind of visualize things. You're hearing it through the audio, but it's not like a YouTube video. You know, there's there's not necessarily pictures popping up of different locations. So the way she manages to explain things and then the emotions she can capture through interviewing the families is just phenomenal. Yeah, Marissa does an excellent job at the website of also pulling together all the photos you need so you, you at least mm -hmm. know who you're looking for in terms of the missing person. But she also works really hard in terms of getting good source material, Freedom of Information Act requests, oh, yeah. police records. Um, I believe she works in the law field as well. And she's got some really good resources in terms of being able to get that information. And then she works it into the interview she's doing and the way that the story is unfolding. Uh, honestly, her podcast is one of my favorite, has been one of my favorite for years. I use it as a source uh, pretty regularly on the channel. And she's such an awesome person. Um, when she is working with a family, if they're looking specifically for exposure on YouTube, she'll reach out to me. When I'm looking working with a family that's looking for podcast exposure, I send them her way. Um, she's just one of those people that really wants to help, and she takes the time and, and does the extra steps to do that. And I really appreciate Marissa. It was a pleasure meeting her at, at CrimeCon last year also. It was. John knows how excited I was when I spotted her from across the room. She really is. I admire her a lot, and I do as well use her uh, in a lot of my different videos for sources. I think she does a fantastic job. I, I appreciate her work a lot. And she also doesn't just kind of do a case and forget about it. She updates yeah. you the second she figures things out. She is waiting on everything yeah. instantly. And she immediately lets you know and updates you so you don't get lost as well. So that's also something that I really appreciate. Yeah, she puts her heart in it which is, oh, is yeah. really an important component for, for doing this. Oh, yeah. But also, we want to remind you that we do have separate YouTube channels. We I do. have one. Oh, no, I've Surprise. got one too. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. We each have our own YouTube channels. So if you want more content from us, we both cover a vast majority of different topics in the true crime genre. And you can find me at Danielle Hallen on YouTube if you search, or you can find me on Twitter at Danielle Hallen. And you can find me at Lord and Arts, or you can search on my show title, Brain Scratch. You can also find me at Twitter at lordandarts.com or no, just at lordandarts. 
But you can go to lordandarts.com if you want to see more stuff. I've, <laughs> I've got that too. So <laughs> I always forget my tag. I literally have to check every single time we were about to do an episode because I changed it. And ever since then, it's just not ingrained in my brain. So I'm like, oh man, I'm going to tell them to look somewhere and they're not going to be able to find me. <laughs> I'm horrible at this. <laughs> uh, if you want to submit ideas for crime after crime, we're looking for more ideas. And thank you to everyone that submitted them so far. But you can send an email to us crime after crime at lordandarts.com or on Twitter, you can just tweet it to us at crime after pod. Crime after crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to say a special thank you to the patrons. As always, they keep limited ads on the YouTube version of this podcast and no ads on the audio version. Plus, if you are a patron, you get a bonus Patreon special monthly and you guys get to see a whole different side of us. Normally, it's me having to tell very embarrassing things about my past. Yeah, John, that, that's what I'm aiming <laughs> for. <laughs> it's very entertaining. It really is. And it's awesome because you also get to see me and John kind of get to know each other a little bit more. So it's absolutely awesome. And patrons get a personal shout out in the different segments as soon as they become a patron. So it's a lot of fun on there. It's it's awesome. Yeah. I suggest you go Definitely. check that out. If you enjoyed this, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. We need help growing, and you are such a major part of that. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Come check out Crime After Crime. Happy holidays, you guys. It is the 1st of December. We are getting into the holiday season. Get your shopping done. Exactly. I need to do that. Oh, gosh. I can't <laughs> think about it. But we will see you guys next time, New Year's Day 2019 on Crime After Crime. Take care. Take care.